North Cameroon, near Makalo, April 1986. To the Mafa of these Mandara highlands, iron is vital, for tools to farm their hillside terraces, for weapons and for ornaments. Their society was shaped by the imperative need to control its production and distribution. For some time now, they have obtained their iron by scrapping broken down vehicles and other debris of development. But a few iron masters still possess the techniques and rituals used for transforming ore into iron for the forge. One of these men is De Quaza, of the village of Vuzod, last of a long line of smelters and smiths. He is visiting the remains of a furnace that served seven generations of his family. De Quaza is now 65. It has been 28 years since he last smelted iron. With the help of his family, he will attempt to reenact the process, starting with the construction of a furnace. The success of a smelt depends upon iron ore, fire, charcoal, air, and the human skills and energy that cause these to react together in such a way as to concentrate the metallic iron into a mass called the bloom. Essential to this process is the furnace in which the reaction takes place. The Mafa furnace consists of a shaft built into a facade with a shield above. On the day of the smelt, the shaft will be sealed. Ore and charcoal are loaded through a charge hole. Behind the shield is a platform. Here, bellows will be installed to force air down into the shaft. A convenient site for the new furnace has been found on a hillside terraced for farming. After an initial prayer and offering, De Quaza digs the base of the furnace shaft into the slope. Badadak, a practicing smith, is De Quaza's eldest son and his chief assistant. De Quaza knows that success can only be achieved by the right combination of physical and spiritual forces. Magic and prayer, technical knowledge and physical effort are inseparable components of his craft. To protect the furnace, he buries a charm beneath the shaft. The base of the furnace is built of dry stone walling. Children bring daub a mixture of clay soil and a tough straw.
The facade is built up like the wall of a house with alternating courses of stones and daub. Early on the first morning, De Quaza prays and offers beer, calling on God, Jigle, and on his ancestors for aid. As a form of communion, he drinks with his wife, De Magai, and then with other workers. Before work ends for the day, the facade is plastered with daub. On the second day, with temperatures as usual in the low 40s Celsius, the platform and the shaft rise higher. A millet stalk serves to measure the height of the shaft. A stone lintel set across the top of the shaft opening provides a strong base for the charge hole and the shield to be built above. After building the shaft higher with coils of daub, De Quaza lays a stone traverse. He cuts and props the opening for the charge hole. After two days' work, the furnace is taking shape, but still lacks its shield and the bellows assembly. On the third day, the facade and furnace shaft are given coats of daub, and the bellows platform reaches its full height. <laughs> Work ends shortly after noon. The fourth morning. Dmagai, a potter, has been making bellows parts. A seat and a stone support for the bellows are set into the platform. The fit of the bowls and nozzles is tested. Meanwhile, a neighbor, Heideck, begins to prepare a sheepskin to make the bags for the bellows. First, he uses grit to scrape it clean. 
then rubs in oil to make it soft and pliable. Daquaza now builds the shield. The furnace is magically strengthened by the addition of a decorated daub belt. The oil is worked into the skin. The sides of the shield are decorated with spikes. These symbolize strength, potency, and achievement. Dequaza installs a bust of his father, Kawa, on top of the shield. Thus he honors his ancestral line and asserts rightful inheritance of their skills. The bust is given eyes of quartz, hard like the iron to be made in the furnace. Lastly, and because smelting to the iron masters is a kind of battle, he inserts a line of grass stems representing the crest of a Mafa war bonnet. With scarcely a pause, Dequaza and his sons go on to assemble the bellows, binding and plastering them firmly into place on the stone support. The bellows nozzles are sealed within the bowls. After three and a half days, construction is complete. As work continues on other tasks, the furnace and the bellows will dry out over the next two days, receiving further coats of daub. At home that afternoon, Dequaza and Badadak begin to build the two-year, a long tube that directs the air blast from the bellows down into the belly of the furnace. Over a pottery tube made by Dumagai, Dequaza applies a special refractory or heat-resistant daub. This section will form the top of the two-year. After adding straw to reinforce the join, the two-year is lengthened by adding cylindrical segments of daub. This daub cracked and crumbled as it dried. A deposit with more clay had to be found to make the two-year used in the smelt. Morning of the seventh day, the furnace has dried. They adjust the position of the bellows assembly. On the platform below, the completed tuyere is propped and drying. Dried plants with protective powers are crushed and worked into a special plaster.
lagi. It is applied to the walls and floor of the furnace shaft. Lastly, Dequaza checks the length of the tree year against the height of the shaft. The furnace is now complete, but must again be left to dry for two days while Dequaza rests and does other jobs. Butadak sees to the preparation of charcoal from selected trees. Dequaza and Demagai demonstrate how ore is gathered and cleaned. The ore is magnetite, an iron oxide that looks like black sand. It is released from the granite rocks of the region as they erode, and because it is heavy, becomes concentrated in stream beds, gullies, even on paths. A first winnowing in the open removes some of the sand. The demonstration continues in the compound where Dequaza makes a small sluice. The lighter sand is gently washed away. A final panning removes all but a trace of sand. After drying, the concentrated, high-quality ore will be ready for the smelt. On the tenth day, the last before the smelt, final preparations are made. The two-year and shaft are rubbed down with a mixture that contains magical plants. Next, Badadak sews each side of the sheepskin into a cone. Dequaza turns these inside out and works them into their final form. <laughs> Lastly, a fire is lit within the shaft in order to test it and to begin the transformation of its many layers of daub into a crude but resistant form of earthenware. All is now ready for the smelt. <coughs> Dequaza is up before daybreak. He tastes and approves beer brewed by Demagai then leaves for the furnace, where he pours a libation to God, to Jigle, present in a sacred pot. At 7.10 a.m., without ceremony, Dequaza and Badadak insert the two-year. Its top is wedged in place, so that it hangs vertically down the shaft. Plastering makes an airtight seal.
With a magical tuber, de Quaza marks the tuyer, ensuring that as the fire eats it away in the course of the smelt, an iron bloom will grow within the shaft. He begins to seal the shaft, packing charcoal, but at this stage, no ore around the tuyer. To prevent the shaft seal from collapsing under its own weight, he supports it with split twigs of fire-resistant ebony. A final preparation, the bellows are readied. coals are tipped down the two-year to ignite the charcoal filling the shaft. Then, before all those who have worked on the furnace and those other smiths, de Quaza's relatives, who are to participate in today's efforts, de Quaza prays, offers beer, and consecrates the jigle pot that will be set to guard the smelt. <laughs> the quasi cuts a vent at the base of the seal. He makes a minor repair. Now is the time for war. It is three minutes past ten. After working the bellows for a moment, and they will never cease until the smelt is over, 10 hours and 21 minutes later, De Quaza hands over to his son, Hishekit, descends to the lower platform and checks that the charge is well and truly lit. Satisfied that it is, he will now retire to his compound to prepare for battle. Turns, dressed as for war, he is accompanied by Badadak, by his nephew Batai, the harpist and second on the bellows, and by a son of Batai. <laughs> He cuts up magical plants, mixes them with a pinch of ore, and with a prayer inserts them down the two year. Ore is then offered to the rising and the setting sun, 
and for the first time loaded through the charge hole. Daquaza plays the bellows like drums. Batai strikes up his harp and they sing antiphonally. This is the first time that music has been allowed near the furnace. From now on, it has the essential continuing role of egging on the bellowsman. De Quaza offers gruel to Juglet before drinking himself. The air blown down the tuyere is heated and delivered to the center of the fuel bed, ensuring even combustion. A cock is sacrificed, its blood offered to the ancestors and to Jigle. It falls on its right side, the best of omens. <laughs> At the tip of the tuyer, the hottest part of the furnace, the oxygen in the ore is combining with carbon monoxide gas from the charcoal and being driven off as carbon dioxide. Impurities in the ore liquefy and tend to drain away as slag, leaving the iron particles in a semi-molten state to concentrate as droplets and lumps in a bloom mass. Because the reaction is less than perfect, and because the hottest part of the furnace moves upwards as the tuyere is eaten away, the bloom, a hodgepodge of lumps of iron, gobbets of slag and unburnt charcoal, also grows upwards from the base of the shaft. As the tuyere tip melts, fusing with molten slag, the quasa prizes it out of the furnace. This frees the airway and allows the smelt to continue. After another set on the bellows, De Quaza removes more of the fused two-year and slag. Come on up. 
He blocks the vent and cuts another just above. This process is repeated many times during the long afternoon as the two year shortens. The blocking up and recutting of the vent is matched by the growth of the bloom in the furnace. A medicinal plant is cut up and inserted down the two year. The Iron Master monitors the flame. The furnace is now working at maximum efficiency. Ore and charcoal are added at a faster rate. Pasty slag now flows to block the vent and is cut out. Dusk at a quarter past six. The vent is now much higher. The smelt continues at full blast, but by 7.30, Dequaz's stock of ore is running low and he is tiring. He has blown the bellows longer and harder than any, and has also prized out the slag. In the old days, with more and more experienced bellowsmen, the smelt would have continued until the bloom mass had filled the shaft. Night falls. Charging of ore and charcoal ceases. Flame bursts through the charge hole.
Balder guy, another son, removes the pile of rocks and ash and cuts through the sides of the shaft seal. At 8.24, the bellows fall silent. The seal is cut away. Revealing the stump of the two-year and a bloom over 40 centimeters high and weighing 15 and a half kilos. The bloom is prized out and doused. The long day's work is over and the bloom carried hurriedly away to Dequaz's compound. Daquaza's compound, some days later. Before de Quaza can forge a hoe from the bloomery iron, he must first refine it. After praying for success, he begins this process mechanically by breaking up a part of the bloom mass and picking out the metallic droplets and lumps. Some are massive. The iron is further broken and crushed in order to remove smaller fragments of slag and charcoal. Meanwhile, Demagai and her husband make five clay crucibles. The forge is tidied and prepared. The fire is lit. Dequaza sharpens the ridge on the massive stone hammer that will be used to spread the blade and socket of the hoe. Demagai passes him the crushed iron in the crucibles, which are set by the fire to bake.
A friend blows the bellows, and a short two-year directs the blast into the firebox. Dequaza fills four of the crucibles with bits of iron. He dribbles a clay slurry over the iron to protect it from reoxidation. He places the first crucible in the fire. Quasa compacts the iron in the crucible. He pulls the semi-molten mass from the fire. Consolidates it with light blows and knocks off the remains of the crucible. After reheating the iron, Daquaza directs as Baldegai draws out the iron into a short bar using a massive smooth stone hammer. This process is repeated for each crucible. Finer forging is done with a cylindrical iron hammer. Next, the pieces must be welded together. Here, Dequaza joins the blade to the top of the shaft. Slurry is applied to assist the weld. Dequaza now takes up the bellows, handing over the forging to Boldegai. Don slurry is removed in the hammering. The hoe is now almost complete. The socket is first flattened with the smooth hammer and then spread with the ridged one. The smith forms the socket.
the blade is spread. Its edge is trued. After quenching, the shaft is bent to the correct angle. Baldagai gives the hoe, the tool on which Mafa agriculture and indeed Mafa life depends, its final touches. <laughs> Dequaza and his family have performed an extraordinary feat, successfully recreating the smelting process from memories of a generation back, and refining and repeated welding of a kind of iron that is by now unfamiliar. How much greater was the achievement of those distant ancestors, whose genius transformed African society some two and a half thousand years ago? They developed a technology so sophisticated in its conception that its execution requires only the simplest tools and materials freely available in nature.